Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan and I'd like to welcome you to the fifth webinar in MOVE Muscle, Bone and Joint Health's 2017 Musculoskeletal Health webinar series. Tonight's webinar is on the topic of pain management in patients with inflammatory arthritis. The list of our webinars for the second half of the year is now available and if you haven't already received the list, it will be sent to you via email next week. Please also remember that the recordings of our previous webinars are also available for purchase at any time. Before introducing our presenter for this evening, I just have a couple of housekeeping issues to run through. Firstly, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please refer to the message box on your screen. You can type a message at any time that will be read by our webinar organiser at Redback Conferencing. If you're listening via the phone, you'll notice there's a small time delay between the audio and the screen. This is normal, so don't be concerned. Also, whilst our presenter will answer questions during the presentation as she feels um, sees fit, uh, but also after the presentation, please type questions for her at any time. Can I suggest you don't leave your questions to the last minute as we will aim to finish strictly at 8pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. I'd also be grateful to participants if they could respond to our feedback survey which will pop up on the screen during uh, towards the end of question time. So our presenter for this evening is Dr Bethan Richards. Bethan is a rheumatologist and a senior clinical lecturer at the University of Sydney. She is currently completing her PhD, has a certificate in clinic, clinician performed ultrasound in musculoskeletal area, a masters in clinical epidemiology and sports medicine, and is an OMEREC arthroplasty and ultrasound fellow. She's also the rheumatology series editor of Medicine Today and the rheumatology representative on the New South Wales Agency for Clinical Innovations Unwarranted Clinical Variation Task Force. Bethan is currently an investigator on more than 10 RCTs, including an NHMRC funded trial, and she's published four Cochrane Systematic Reviews with another two in progress. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Bethan. Thanks very much, Bethan. Thank you, Jen, for that um, extraordinary introduction. Um, good evening, everyone, and um, thank you for joining what I think is a really critically um, important topic of pain management in adult inflammatory arthritis. Um, and my aim tonight, I guess, is to try and share with you some of my experiences in, in managing this issue um, and give you some practical tips along the way for how to deal with what is really a common problem um, and an under-recognized problem, I think, in patients that have inflammatory arthritis. Um, as Jen said, please feel free to interrupt me uh, or send questions along the way. Um, the more interactive uh, this is, the, the you know, very happy to answer questions um, that will come up, particularly off the back of the case discussion as well. So the first thing I guess is to um, just define exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about inflammatory arthritis. Um, so essentially it's any condition um, that affects the joints where inflammation is present. Um, there will be common ones um, that you'll see in clinical practice, um, the most common being rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which affects one in every hundred people. Um, but other ones you might come into contact with are things like psoriatic arthritis, um, things that affect the spine and the joints that we call spondyloarthritis, uh, reactive arthritis that can follow infection, uh, or other connective tissue diseases such as systemic lupus erythematosus. There's really a wide range and there certainly are, are several others out there as well, but these will be the common ones and I'll, I'll focus a little bit on these tonight to um, give you some tips about how to recognise the cause of pain in these patients. So I thought I'd do this via um, a case study along the way to try and illustrate some, some points. So this is Mary and Mary is a, a typical patient that I would see in clinic. So she's a 52 year old office worker. Um, she's had a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. She's been through a series of um, disease-modifying treatments, the most common one um, that she's still on, which is methotrexate. Um, and more recently, she's 
been switched to these new very expensive but usually effective biologic agents. And when I see her in clinic, to me her disease appears to be in remission. Um, but unfortunately when I sort of give her the good news with these blood test results, she looks back at me and actually says, well, that's really great news. I'm happy to hear that, doctor, but why do I still have pain everywhere? And that's actually a fairly common sentiment that's out there. So I thought I'd use that to launch into trying to understand and trying to be able to answer that question for our patients. So as part of the, um, the research that I'm doing for my PhD, one of the things I did is went to look to see how common a problem this actually was. Because from my clinical practice, it seemed that I was treating people with um, drugs that should be really effective and all their blood tests were telling me that they were responding to their treatment. But they seemed to still have pain. So I went back to um, a database that we have in Australia called the Australian Rheumatology Association database. And basically, um, that's a registry that patients with any inflammatory arthritis can be entered into. And it follows them over the course of their disease. And basically, I just went back and really asked, I wanted to have a look at one question, which was, in the past week, how much pain had they had? And how bad was that on this scale of 0 to 100? There was a large amount of patients um, when I looked in 2014. There were over 1,500 patients. And I looked at rheumatoid arthritis, just to, to have a look at one condition. And about 85% uh, of these patients were on the new, newest line therapy. So they were on current day therapy. We had some really interesting results. So when we looked and just asked the question, had they had any level of pain at all, 94% of them reported some level of pain. But of more concern, 58% rated in the moderate to severe levels of pain. So this was an incredibly um, high proportion of therapy. Um, just to explain what biologic therapy is, um, thank you for the question. So biologic therapies are the newest range of um, therapies that have been developed, um, that are developed um, from either um, basically designing an antibody, um, which is made either within a human or as a hybrid, um, sometimes with um, mouse models. Um, and basically, the antibody is against the common in inflammation markers um, that are the chemicals in the blood that cause the problem in people that have an inflammatory arthritis. So these are very powerful drugs that suppress the immune system and certainly can increase a patient's risk of infection. So what we found is the people that were failing the initial types of treatment that we had, and we call them disease-modifying agents, they're the tablets like methotrexate or leflunamide or sulfasalazine that have been around for, for sort of 20 to 50 years, these new agent biologics are very powerful. And so the thought was that they, by turning off the disease much better, should cure the patient's symptoms. And so what we were finding is even on people taking these biologic therapies that should be turning off the disease, they still were reporting high levels of pain. Hopefully that answers your question, Louise. The other thing we found from the research, and as no doubt you'll all know out there, is that poorly controlled pain is associated with a lower quality of life for the patient, higher levels of disability, um, and importantly, also emotional distress and depression. And if you look at the literature in these patients, about 30% of patients with rheumatoid arthritis will report coexistent symptoms of, of depression. So pain is a really important um, factor in the overall well-being of patients. So we thought this was a really under-recognized issue in the rheumatological community. And at sent home the point to us that we actually need to separate out disease management from pain management. And actually, they're two quite different things. The other thing that was of quite um, considerable concern to us and that we were very surprised at, but is certainly a finding that's been replicated around the world, is that again, despite being on these um, 
very expensive and what are thought to be effective therapies, 26% of the patients in this database were using opioid therapy to control their pain. Um, and that's quite against the evidence that actually shows that opioids are really quite terrible for controlling pain in this patient population. More recently, there's been a lot of um, media attention on the um, mortality risk or the death risk associated with people um, taking long-term opioids. So this has really brought this issue um, to front and centre attention. So have a look and see why this is happening, why um, opioids are being prescribed and what we can do about it. The other thing from the research we found is that if a patient was started on an opioid, so these are um, tablets like codeine or endone or oxycontin or morphine, so very strong analgesic or pain medication, if the patient at any point in time was started on it, 40% of them continue to use it for a very long period of time. So the mean of that was 20 months. So there were half the people that used it far longer than 20 months and half the people um, less than that. So this again was a really concerning finding and we wanted to try and understand why this was happening. So what did this initial um, data tell us? It told us that Mary's presentation with pain despite appearing to have normal um, disease or good disease control is not an unusual one. And that it's quite a prevalent finding that patients with inflammatory arthritis are still reporting moderate to severe levels of pain despite being on what we think is good therapy. The second thing is I mentioned and it was sort of a take home message and one of the things um, that I think is the key message of the talk tonight particularly for the, the clinicians managing the drugs out there, is we need to completely separate the disease control from the pain management and actually see them as two different issues to ask the patient about when we're seeing them in the consult room. The third thing is there's really an unmet um, need um, for pain management um, out there and there seems to be a um, high prevalence of needing to turn to opiate therapy. So maybe we're not managing pain really as well as we should be. Um, and tonight, hopefully, I'll give you some other tips about how we can try and avoid that happening going forward. So I think the first thing when I was um, undertaking the evidence-based review was really trying to understand and this has been very helpful with patients um, to try and convey to them, is this issue of why and how do we experience pain and use that to try and understand the different mechanisms of pain that we're talking about in these patients with inflammatory arthritis. So for the Latin scholars out there, um, the word pain comes from poena, which means punishment from God. So historically pain has obviously a very negative connotation. In terms of our evolution though, it's an incredibly important protective mechanism um, and there's, we're all aware of patients out there who lose the um, ability to detect pain. So for example in patients that have diabetes and who lose their protective mechanism of pain in their feet are predisposed to getting foot ulcers and things. So it is a necessity that we have the ability to sense pain. In terms of how the basic pain system works, the picture of um, stepping on a tack, usually um, just by looking at that picture will, will um, create in your mind and make you feel a, a response, an emotional response to that. And so why is that happening? Well, there's a tissue um, injury that happens at the time. And the peripheral nerves, so the nerves that are sitting in our feet, fire a signal. And this signal travels up a hardwired messaging system, which is our spinal cord, and essentially goes to our processing center, which is the brain. And the brain tells us that we have pain. And it then incites us to action to not take another step to, that would cause us 
further tissue damage. And so it actually leads to a behavioural response, which is why we look at a picture like that, we're almost wanting to pull up our foot. We've got this ingrained, hardwired response um, to this situation. What happens in patients with inflammatory arthritis then and how do they detect pain? So it's similar in a way that instead of having the tack cause the pain, the patient's own immune system, usually the disease that they have, leads to a chemical inflammation. And the chemicals in the body, um, are the most common ones are these ones here called TNF-alpha or IL interleukin-1 or IL-6. And these are actually going back to the biologic question, what the biologics are targeted at to turn off when they try to turn off disease activity. So in our patients with inflammatory arthritis, their disease leads to these chemicals that get released in the body. And those chemicals are actually responsible for propagating the tissue injury that's occurring inside the joint. Again, the tissue injury then stimulates peripheral nerves, and this time it's in the structures that are around the joint in patients that have inflammatory arthritis. And that might be in the joint lining that we call the synosium, or the capsule, or tendons or ligaments, um, or even the bone underneath. So there's a whole lot of different areas those peripheral nerves can fire from. Again, the hardwiring messaging system takes that um, pain signal that's occurred because of the chemical inflammation to the brain and we get our pain response. What we see clinically with this in the tissue injury is joint swelling and a localised problem. So because of this chemical damage tends to occur around the lining of joints or the synovium, you get a localised pain and tenderness around that area because the peripheral nerves are firing. And in this case, in the picture, it's the PIP or proximal interphalangeal joint where the problem is. So when we're trying to treat patients that have inflammatory arthritis, and they've got pain, the first really important question to try and sort out is do they have ongoing disease activity? So do they have inflammation that's still present that's contributing to their pain? This is a really important but often difficult question to answer. So some of the things that I'll do in clinic to try and um, answer this question is to ask the specific um, history questions, I guess, that I find quite useful. So one of the key things with inflammation that we um, use as a marker of that when we're asked patients is this concept of stiffness. So stiffness is the code that there's an inflammatory process. It's the medical language that we use to mean that there's an inflammation process occurring. In the textbooks, they'll often say it's got to be more than half an hour to be an inflammatory disease or less than half an hour means that it's probably not and it might just be due to an injury or maybe a bit of osteoarthritis. In real life practice, I think it's actually early morning stiffness that's present for multiple hours or the whole day that, that is quite a useful differentiator. The other things are things like um, pain and stiffness that get better with heat processes. So patients will often tell you that they have a hot shower and that relieves the pain and stiffness in the joint. Or they'll start to move the joint and they'll actually feel better, which is very different to a mechanical pain where the more they move the joint, the worse the pain gets. So that's an important differentiating factor that I use when I'm trying to work out is this an inflammatory problem or is it underlying joint damage and a more mechanical type problem? The people that have had chronic diseases, patients, they usually know their disease quite well. Um, and some of them have better insight into this than others. And for the ones that do have good insight, I find the question of actually just asking them whether they feel that this is their usual arthritis, and in this case rheumatoid arthritis pain, can be quite um, a useful question to ask. Things patients will often have done themselves or that I will trial with them 
uh, to see if the pain goes away with a little bit of anti-inflammatory or sometimes an increase in their corticoid or prednisone therapy. The pain that's not going away with that is very unlikely to be inflammatory in nature. I also look for an absence of other things and one of the real yellow flags I look for is is there just pain everywhere in this patient's body. Often less likely if they've got this widespread pain and it often goes with poor sleep and not feeling very well, that inflammation is driving that. That's usually a, a sign that they've got a central sensitization problem like fibromyalgia and I'll talk a little bit about that. The other thing that's really important to the clinician and something I just want to go through in a little bit of detail now is to look at where the pain is and where, where, the, where it is is actually consistent where the disease process is occurring. So what do I mean by that? In rheumatology, one, it's a really a, a clinical specialty and so joint patterns and the the, um, where the disease is occurring or where the pain to the patient is occurring is really important in trying to sort out is this the patient's usual disease process or is this a secondary type problem. Just to answer um, a couple of questions that have come through. One is, is cold therapy effective and why is it heat with the inflammation response? So if I just go back to that slide very, very quickly, the analogy I use um, with patients is when you get inflammation in your joint, the stiffness type feeling is a bit like the analogy of um, putting melted butter in the fridge overnight. And what happens to all those chemicals is that they tend to sort of almost solidify. And when you heat that butter up or you heat the chemicals up with um, therapies like um, a hot pack or a shower, you start to um, change that congealed type of liquid into a looser one which allows the joints to move more easily. And so I find that analogy quite useful when trying to explain this concept of stiffness with patients and why heat and cold change that overnight? Why does it take a while to get going and, and loosen up that way? So I think it's a change in the chemical properties um, in the joint. Second question that's come um, through is, is it inflammatory pain if it's relieved by heat and gen gentle movement? So it's one of the indicators that I use when I'm trying to put together a whole pattern for the patient in front of me, that it's more likely to be inflammatory pain if it's relieved by heat and general, gentle movement. None of this in rheumatology is 100% certain. And so really what I'm looking for is that in addition to some other things, like what I'm about to talk about with the right pattern, like that it responds to um, anti-inflammatory therapy, to try and put this um, pattern together for the patient to say whether I think there's inflammation there. And there's a few other things that I'll talk about that we now look for if we have this sense from the history that we can try and confirm this observation with some other insights and tests. So the first thing is on clinical examination, if the patient with rheumatoid arthritis is complaining of joint, that's joint pain that's either not in their usual rheumatoid joints um, or in, for example, their um, DIPs or distal interphalangeal or their CMC joints, then that's not going to be rheumatoid because rheumatoid does not affect those joints. So that's really important to know the disease patterns that way, to know if um, the rheumatoid in this case is actually contributing to the patient's um, current presentation of pain. What is a common thing that happens is you get the rheumatoid under control but they still have pain and when you examine them it's not in their usual joints like the MCP and PIP and actually what they've got is a separate process which is osteoarthritis. And being able to pick that 
is very important because it means that we don't change their rheumatoid medication and we suddenly go down a different treatment pathway which is for osteoarthritis instead. So that's one, probably one of the commonest mistakes is not to confuse osteoarthritis with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and these slides will all be available but there's other common patterns that I've listed there for the other diseases that make it useful to work out is this um, due to their disease. This is just an example of um, what I was talking about with um, recognising different patterns. So this is showing you osteoarthritis that's um, apparent in the CMC joint here down on the bottom right, which is not a joint that would be um, due to rheumatoid arthritis pain. And when you see bony swelling like this in the distal interphalangeal joint, um, things that we call Hebbenen's nodes, again, if patients have pain here, you would not put this down to rheumatoid arthritis pain. So the joint patterns are really important um, that way. Um, Wendy's question that's just come through is um, in regards to a patient with lupus and why running hands under cold water first thing in the morning might be soothing um, and helps relieve resting joint stiffness. Um, so that's probably a slightly different issue and not due to joint inflammation. And some people that have vascular or blood vessel issues to do with their disease sometimes find that running hands under cold water can impact their nerves in a different way and actually get some relief. That's far less common. Most people will, will um, get benefit from heat therapies rather than colder. But there are some conditions where nerves and capsules can be affected where you can see. And as I mentioned, none of this is black and white. So in addition to the history, we clinically examine patients for joint swelling. And the other thing we obviously use is some blood tests. And the ones we often rely on are these inflammatory markers called the ESR and the CRP. But one thing to keep in mind um, that you can sometimes get tricked on is that those markers can sometimes be normal even if low-grade inflammation is present. Um, and so in this day and age, we often look at some other um, disease activity markers for that. And again, I've given a list here for the different um, disease processes. And for example, in lupus, if we take that case um, for Wendy, we would look at other things like, is there an increase in the double-stranded DNA if that's present, or is there a reduction in the complement um, that might give clues to disease activity. So we're putting the history together with the physical exam and then some of these tests to try and help us understand if, if disease activity is there. And so you can see it's really not an easy thing to do. One of the things I now do quite commonly, and I have a machine in my practice, is actually in these particular patients where I'm a little bit unsure is to do ultrasound. And I'm finding that quite useful in patients where um, they don't have obvious inflammation but they've got some tenderness to see if they've got what we call low-grade or subclinical inflammation. Um, and that's quite useful even to show the patients as well about what's happening underneath their skin. Um, and you can see here a normal um, joint, a joint that's got a mild amount of inflammation in the little and a joint that's got a lot of inflammation in the bottom. The other test that I will occasionally but very rarely go to, um, particularly in patients that have a lot of um, joint damage underneath and I'm trying to work out is the pain from joint damage or ongoing synovitis is an MRI scan. So that's not something I would commonly do um, but it is there and it can answer that important question when need be. So what do we do if patients do have some low grade or you suspect they have low grade inflammation present? So if you think the pain is due to that, then there's a few things that I'll do depending on the individual. Sometimes um, if they're not on a lot of other therapies, they'll, um, you can try an anti-inflammatory agent. And there's a whole variety of different ones that you, you might use depending on patients. 
One um, point about anti-inflammatories is, um, for some reason, one type of anti-inflammatory will work in a patient that will completely not help the next patient, um, and there'll be a reverse scenario. So, failing one anti-inflammatory doesn't mean you're going to fail all of them. And so, I do try different ones um, if they haven't worked in a in, in a patient, and we say particularly with patients with comorbidities, to use them in the lowest dose for the shortest time period possible. Something I find really useful um, when there's a single joint is to actually inject the joint. So if I think there's some low grade, you can give patients a lot of relief without having to expose them to systemic therapy by injecting joints. And sometimes we forget about that, um, that option or maybe don't have the skill to do it. But it's a really valuable one when there's only one or even one or two joints um, that are particularly problematic in a patient where you think there is inflammation. Sometimes if I think it's there or I want to see if it's there, I'll try either a short course of low-dose prednisone. So low-dose I mean between 5 to 10 milligrams. Or if they're already on prednisone, I'll just try increasing a little bit to see if we make a significant difference to the patient's symptoms. And really I'm looking for if there's no effect there, that that's you know, further evidence that this is unlikely to be an inflammatory process. If there is a response, then what I know is that my other tablets or biologic therapies aren't quite controlling that patient's disease. And so what I need to do is then modify their underlying arthritis medications so that I don't have to keep them on a, a dose, a higher dose of prednisone. So they're all useful strategies if I think inflammation is present. A common um, situation though is you go through all that and you can't find any inflammation. So if you go through all that and you can't find any inflammation. But the patient like Mary still has locally tender sore joints and that she wants to understand why that's happened. So if we go back to the mechanism of pain and we think about the inflammatory pain pathway, what happens is if you have that chemical inflammation that's in the joint for a period of time, and we think this period of time is, is probably several weeks, the actual nerves in the joints become hypersensitive and they learn to fire without any noxious stimulus being present. And so what happens is even though you take away any ongoing chemical injury, you've got these hypersensitized nerves that still are sending a signal up to the brain to say, I'm feeling a sensation of pain. And so what the patient reports is that they've got localized pain in that joint. But when you go to examine them, you can't find any evidence of inflammation. And that's a, um, a problem um, that's important to be able to explain to patients because it means that there's not an ongoing tissue injury. We're hardwired to think if there's a pain signal going to the brain that there's an ongoing tissue injury and we should stop what we're doing. But in this case of peripheral sensitization, there's actually not an ongoing tissue injury. And so we need to um, help patients understand that as and why we need to gently exercise the joints to try and improve this problem. So this is called peripheral sensitization. And the analogy I try and use that people can often identify with, it's a bit like when you get a sunburn. So when you get sunburn um, and you've got that, uh, you're out in the sun and you've got the burn to the skin and then you come away and the sun's no longer burning your skin, you still have that tenderness for often days afterwards. And it's the same sort of thing that happens um, to the peripheral nerves in the joint. So in this case, the tenderness is due to peripheral sensitization. And this um, is, is a subtle thing to try and treat. And one of the most important things about it is actually to explain the concept, I think, to patients so that they don't have fear avoidance behaviors. What you'll find is that and because there's no ongoing inflammation, that anti-inflammatories or any change to immunosuppression does not change this tenderness at all. So there's no point in putting 
steroids in or increasing prednisone doses or anything like that. What we do find is quite useful is starting to um, gently move the joint and actually gentle aerobic exercise. Um, and that helps patients again with their fear and anxiety around protecting the joint. Um, and actually, if you get some aerobic activity going, you release endorphins, um, which in a way try and reset the pain system is a, is a nice simplistic way of trying to explain it to patients. The other thing that you'll often find when you start to get tenderness and fear is there are other influences of pain that I'll talk about. Um, if you manage this well and you manage the influences, then in people that just have peripheral sensitization after they've had um, an episode of joint inflammation, this will just gradually settle with time and go away. If it's not well managed, unfortunately one of the things that can happen is the patient then goes on to develop a more widespread pain problem. And you'll usually be able to detect this when they tell you that they're just sore everywhere. Or you touch them very, very gently and they have a jumpy sort of response. You'll all know the patient I'm talking about. And this is the concept of fibromyalgia. So why does this, why does this happen? Again, if we go back to the, the diagram, We've had the initial um, disease and tissue injury, which again has led to this peripheral sensitization. And if you don't manage this process and you have ongoing peripheral sensitization, then basically the process moves up the chain and what you then get is a central sensitization problem. So the spinal cord and higher centers start to misfire and you have this concept of widespread pain. And when you touch a patient, they will send a pain signal up to their brain with a non-noxious stimuli. So they are feeling tenderness and they're the jumpy ones that you think, why are you, you know, feeling so much pain when I've just lightly touched you? So their, their peripheral nerves and their central nerves are really um, hyper-stimulated and are firing or misfiring without any noxious stimuli ongoing. And again, the important things to understand here are that this pain does not mean there's an ongoing tissue injury. It's a really important concept to get across to patients because again, their brain is hardwired to think that they've got this pain, they need to stop what they're doing. They must have the disease, the rheumatoid or whatever it is, must still be active because they have pain. And so I spend a lot of time explaining this concept to people um, and how we need a different management approach to their rheumatoid to, to manage this problem. The other thing in any pain management um, um, scenario is that whatever pain signals are going to the brain, the emotional um, processing of that is going to be influenced by a whole lot of other factors. And they're things like mood, sleep, how tired we are. If I have a poor night's sleep and I'm feeling a bit grumpy, I feel a bit achy and sore the next day. What my health beliefs are or what my previous pain experiences have been are totally going to um, influence or amplify my response um, and my feeling of that pain level. And so if I've got low mood or I've got terrible sleep or I've got fear, anxiety, um, or I've had a previous bad experience, I'm going to feel more pain. Even though the same amount of signals are being processed in my brain, the impact of that is going to be far greater. And so recognising that and recognising that managing these amplifiers of pain are just as important as trying to manage the input of the pain is a really important concept that I use with patients. So understanding that pain is a unique experience. So I'll have 10 different rheumatoid arthritis patients who all have exactly the same amount of disease and they'll all have completely different levels and experiences of pain and it will impact them in different ways. And so with any pain management approach, what does this mean? It means we've got to manage the individual patient. So to do that, we need an individualized approach and a targeted approach. So understanding what's driving the pain by those mechanisms that we've just talked about 
is really important when designing how to manage the individual um, and their influencing factors. So as I mentioned, there's a whole lot of things that are contributing to the individual's experience of pain. And I've mentioned some here, but you know, other things that are focused or, or that come up in patients that have inflammatory arthritis is whether they have coexistent osteoarthritis, whether they've got joint instability, um, whether they're overweight or still smoking, which can drive um, the inflammatory processes or whether they've got other health conditions. So knowing all of this is really important in the overall management of patients with inflammatory arthritis. And I think is driving a lot of the fact of why 58% of them are saying they've still got ongoing pain despite good disease control. The important thing that I always set up front with these patients uh, is that there is no single pill that will be able to fix this scenario. Patients and doctors want a quick fix. It makes us feel good if we can take away someone's pain. But the reality is with this problem, and it can cause more harm than good, to actually sell an expectation that we can cure all pain and that we can fix it with a single tablet. And opioids are not the way and are never going to fix all these different influences and, and um, contributors to the patient's pain. So resetting the expectations up front is really important. The other thing is that the, the patient like this often needs a healthcare team. This is a chronic care disease, uh, a chronic disease that needs chronic management often for a long period of time. The patients that have this often get it in their early 20s and have it for a good part of their, their lives. So surrounding them with the right people becomes really important and for those people to have a good united strategy and be giving the same messages to the patient is also really important. So there's no point me telling them that um, it's fine to move their joints and, and then go through explaining that they haven't got active joint disease and that they have peripheral or central sensitization. And then they go to their second healthcare provider who tells them they shouldn't be exercising on that joint. So we need to be all on the same page and have a united strategy with the patient to build their trust um, in this process. There's a lot of barriers to that with the current health system that we have, unfortunately, be it access, cost, communication, um, previous um, harms from therapies um, or patient belief systems. So this is why it's such a complex and difficult um, area that, that really requires engagement and a long-term um, strategy to engage the patient and go through that journey with them. And setting that expectation up front again is really important when we manage these types of people. So what do I do? I set goals and I've tried over years and I've become much better at not making it a pain goal. So I no longer try and use a number or aim for a zero out of ten pain goal. What we're trying to do is actually reduce the suffering of that individual patient because a number out of ten means a very different thing to an individual patient. So I look at what ways we, the pain is impacting them and how we can improve function, quality of life and at the same time minimise the harm of anything that I'm doing with the patient. So they're the goals. And there's certain techniques you can do to um, engage the patient and the, one of the common ones known is this SMART technique. And it's an acronym about goal setting and actually how to do this in a really um, achievable way for an individual patient. And this is something I must say as I've got more senior in my career I've, I've got better at and I've realised the importance of actually setting achievable goals and almost setting things that are so easy for the patient that you don't allow them to fail. And so an example of that when we're setting a strategy might be we're considering trying to get them to do an exercise session and really you want them to do it three to five times a week. And you think that maybe they'll be able to do a couple of sessions a week. So the goal that I'd set them is if they could do one hydrotherapy session a week that's the 
specific nature. So rather than just, I want you to do hydrotherapy, I want you to do one session a week or a five minute walk um, just once a week and aim to, you know, inc let's have a look at that in a month and let's see if we achieve that. So set something down with them and put it in writing and then set a time frame where you're going to review that goal with them and allow them to have some success in that so that there's not a, a failure type approach. When I have an overall pain management, I'm using that goal technique and really I'm, I try and step back and I say, okay, what are the inputs? Is there any residual inflammation? Is there a mechanical cause to the pain? Is it a central or peripheral central sensitization cause? Or is there maybe a neuropathic type injury if the patient's had something like a vasculitis before? Then I look at the amplifiers of that pain. So they're all the things like the poor sleep, the fatigue, the depression, the um, fear and anxiety. And that's probably in clinical practice the most common one I would see in anyone that's had pain for a period of time um, is the biggest amplifier. And they may or may not talk to you about this up front, but there's a, or often anxiety about what's happening and a misunderstanding about what's happening and what it means. When we're managing these patients overall, we have to look at these to design our program. And so we talked about how to manage joint inflammation, but what about um, the other you know, overarching pain management strategies and how do we also focus on managing the amplifiers? Because at the end of the day, they're often more important and more effective at reducing pain and its impact on patients than reducing the input. So what strategies do I use? If I could do one strategy with all of this, and I think the thing I found is most effective um, going forward is, is that education. But the education is teaching people to understand what's driving their pain and separating the disease management from the pain management. And it's amazing how just giving them that sense of understanding gives them a sense of control back over the disease, often in a scenario where they feel like they've lost control uh, and the disease is overtaking their life. The second thing about the goal setting is a setting realistic expectations. Don't set the patients up to fail by having them think that when you try physiotherapy or try whatever strategy it is, that it's going to get better in a week or two. So I often set even longer a goal. I say, look, this is a six month to 12 month type um, process that I'm going to try and help you with um, before we're going to make really significant um, um, differences. We're going to support you and help you and there's going to be slow improvement along the way. But realistically, give them that long term view of trying to learn from management. No one single pill, as I imagine, is going to fix this. And so what I often use is a combination of strategies and different ones will work in different patients. And then the other thing is um, providing a regular review of what's happening. Because again, that helps with the anxiety component for pain. If they know they're coming back to see you regularly, they're less um, anxious about what might happen on bad days or if they lose control of their disease. And often, um, the other thing is, you know, we're very good at having action plans for people with asthma or diabetes, but historically we've been really bad for giving people an action plan for what to do on a bad day. And people with chronic pain often fear with their fluctuant disease that they, what they're going to do on a bad day, who are they going to see and what will happen. Yeah, they feel fine today and they're almost frustrated when they come and see you because they, their pain's a bit better but it wasn't what it was like a week ago when they didn't know what to do. And so giving them an action plan of what to do can be really useful. So what are some of the things that um, I try and do instead of going to um, tablets or osteotype therapy? The money in pain management, I think, um, and where you can often make the difference is the non-pharmacological options. And that's because when we look at the evidence for all the pharmacological options, they're not very good. And any improvements they make are very modest. They also have a lot of harm. And so the beauty of the non-pharmacological options is that they have very few harms. 
So patient education keeps coming up and up um, and again teaching them to understand their disease or, or um, factors of the disease and empowering them to manage their pain particularly with a bad day management plan may be the most useful thing you can do for them up front. Strategies that people try and all patients and we've heard from responses online are a little bit different. Most people respond to to heat therapy. Some people at times will respond to cold pack therapy. Cold packs usually are used for more acute inflammation rather than, um, rather than chronic um, type pain processes. Something that's often forgotten about, um, particularly in the medicalized world, is, is the usefulness of orthoses and splints. And there's a fine um, balance there between supporting a joint that's got damage in it and stopping a patient using a joint that we actually want them to use. And so you need to make a fairly careful decision about whether this is um, peripheral sensitization of fibromyalgia and we don't want them to use too many protective devices versus a joint that's got a lot of damage in it um, where when they use it, it is causing um, um, some pain to them. Things that have variable and some people will swear by and others say they absolutely do nothing are things like the TENS machine, um, massage and acupuncture. I don't um, send people off for that because I think it gives you a self um, limiting or a small effect. But if patients truly believe and it works for them, then I would never take that away from them. So what patients believe works as long as it's not doing harm is really, really important. Exercise therapy and keeping the muscles and ligaments strong and be it using hydrotherapy, which is the warm water and gets people going, um, I think are some of the most effective things I do, particularly in people that have got fibromyalgia or that peripheral pain. People that have um, you know, end stage bad disease, um, obviously joint replacement is incredibly effective. That's not what the focus is on for so much this talk. We would send those patients um, off for, for joint replacement. But often we've got to manage them or maybe they're too sick to have a joint replacement. How do we go forward with those people? The amplifying factors, one of the you know, simple things to talk about um, is ways to improve sleep. And again, it's amazing how powerful it is if you can get someone to have a good night's sleep who's had um, chronic pain. There's a variety of strategies that are out there and, and there's lots of people that uh, and resources you can go to but simple things and the benefits of engaging people to do physical activity is you will improve their sleep pattern. You'll allow them to um, um, get some hopefully sun exposure during the day that then helps their circadian rhythm and that helps with getting their sleep patterns under control. One of the big problems today is they're anything like a working person or a young person is that they've got a huge amount of screen time. They're looking at their iPhones or their iPads or things before bed, which is really bad sleep behaviour. Avoiding alcohol and caffeine and all the other simple things or having soothing activities like taking a warm bath might be a nice way to, to improve that. So there are really useful strategies in patients where you know, the tablets aren't really making a big difference. There are patients that we do need to use tablets in and um, you know I have this graded approach and most of the patients will be taking Panadol over the counter and often an anti-inflammatory anyway. Um, the local corticosteroids I've talked about. I really don't add and try and avoid at all costs any codeine or tramadol or those other agents unless there is a degree of joint damage underneath. Uh, and usually I need to do imaging with x-rays to have a look at that and people have failed local injections into knees and things. Sometimes, and again I don't go to this up front, but for the fibromyalgia and people that have got inflammatory arthritis, I might try, if sleep is a big issue, sometimes an adjuvant agent and a little bit of amitriptyline at night time. Um, or if there's an anxiety component, sometimes we'll use metazapine or some other agent. But I usually try and get the patient to see a psychologist um, or a psychiatrist um, if I'm going to do that to find one that helps their overall mood side of things and whether there's an anxiety component that needs medication. Symptoms. 
So they can be useful, but I'd really try not to go to those up front um, if possible, knowing that if you can get people exercising and with positive um, thought processes and behavioural therapies, you can make a really big difference. Lastly, just to, to touch on the bad day management plan, again, this is just about giving control back to um, patients um, and having a written plan for how to do this. Um, I think it's a really powerful strategy. So the two things I do are educate the patient, teach them about you know, why they're understanding their symptoms so it makes sense to them in their world, talking about the amplification um, and then um, looking at some of the, the strategies to reduce those amplification um, and bringing them back regularly. So having that, you know, when do they call me? When do they seek medical attention advice? useful that way. I can see a question come through about the um, cost for paid options and I agree it's a real problem that all the things that are most important and safe for pain management are actually costly and not funded well by the health system and I think as a group together we need to really lobby for this and you know it's much easier for me and the patient to have a cheap grip for opioid which might cost them nothing or six dollars and very expensive then to go and get proper um, you know, physiotherapy or occupational therapy or hydrotherapy, which is a real barrier. And, and these are the barriers that the health system is putting up for us. Um, mindful that I've got a little bit of time, but you know, the management plan for what I did for Mary at the beginning is harping on the idea of education, using the allied therapies like hydrotherapy that also trying to improve her, her sleep or reduce her smoking as important parts and seeing that as an important part of um, pain management and then giving her very specific goals amongst that with re-evaluation re process. So just to summarise and if there's any further questions please feel free to um, send them through. Pain is a really common problem um, and, and, and an rec under-recognised one traditionally in patients have inflammatory arthritis and it often doesn't correlate with their disease activity and trying to explain that's really important to patients. They often will have multiple mechanisms that hopefully you'll have a better understanding now to do with peripheral and central sensitisation um, and that's to do with peripheral and central sensitisation. Um, and that to treat them we really have to have this individualised approach based on what are their inputs and what are their amplifiers of therapy. Make sure we give them a bad day management plan um, and make sure we re review this and see them regularly so that if our strategies aren't working, particularly if you have gone to anything like opioids, then you discontinue those and you try something else. So that's, um, that's all my, I was going to say, and whether or not there's any other questions, feel free to send them through. Thank, thanks very much, Bethan, for a really interesting and, and such an important um, uh, presentation because, uh, you know, the issue of, of uh, chronic pain, persistent pain, is, is just um, one that is just, you know, as you sort of say, not being recognised as much as it should be. So. I think that's really given the audience um, lots of worthwhile information to, to think about. I, I will stick to our sort of uh, deadline of 8 o'clock so we, um, there's no further questions coming through so I think we will finish up. I'll ask people to uh, complete the, uh, the exit survey if they could. Also I'll just let you know if people are interested on, on our website. We've just um, put on our uh, uh, booklet that's been produced, um, Managing Your Pain which again has some very excellent non-pharmacological sort of uh, self-management ideas for people who might be experiencing persistent chronic pain. So um, I'll, I'd advise you to have a look at our website where that's currently available. Again, Bethan, thank, thank you so much for the presentation this evening. I'd also like to thank everyone who has joined the webinar tonight and uh, wish you all a very pleasant rest of the evening. Good night. Thank you.